in 2012, I started pursuing my PhD in human-centered computing. At that time, I met my colleague, uh, Chris Crawford. Well, he was about to also start his PhD. We were about to start in the same lab uh, under, uh, under the advisement of our advisor, uh, Juan Gilbert. Now, uh, of course, I knew that he has been working with drones when he was an undergrad, and when I was an undergrad, I was working with brain computer interfaces for several years. So one night, I asked uh, uh, Chris, pretty much, like, hey, what are you working on? So he said that, well, you know, not much. Uh, some of the projects that uh, our advisor pretty much assigned to me. Okay. So um, I heard that you have been working with drones before. So yeah, I worked with some drones, uh, physical drones, and some simulation, uh, more from the very traditional uh, robotic side of things. I'm like, All right, so I have, then I told them I have been working with brain computer interfaces, and I started explaining to him what brain computer interfaces actually meant, right? So pretty much in a nutshell, brain computer interfaces is when you're wearing a neurotechnology uh, cap or uh, headset and uh, read your electrical activity from the brain, also known as an EEG, which is the most tra uh, traditional and famous uh, neurotechnology that they use nowadays. And also, you, you pretty much take those signals and you clean those uh, signals from noise and the wanted signals that uh, is no brain activity. And, and then you send those clean signals to a machine learning algorithm to be to classify those, those raw signals to a specific application. So in this case, it could be uh, on actually control wheelchairs or neuroprosthetics or any other application that uh, we actually see fit. Then I say, okay, how about if uh, we uh, work on controlling drones through the brain, right? So, the, so pretty much when I brought it up was because I have been brainstorming of what would be next, right? So we wanted to work on something more that uh, the scientific field have not really been concentrating on for some time, uh, we knew, uh, I mean, I knew that we have been, uh, they have been working on wheelchairs, with wheelchairs and neuroprosthetics and also exoskeletons, but how about drones? At the time, of course, there were some few universities already working on brain-controlled drones, but it wasn't really as formal as it is, of, of course, today. Even today, brain-controlled drones is not widely researched as other areas. Of course, when I brought the brain-controlled drones to Chris, he gave me this phase of, confused, right? So he was, pretty much he was looking at me like, what are you talking about, right? So he looked at me like I was, <laughs> uh, pretty much he was so confused that he, wanted, he thought I needed to be taken to like the hospital or anything like that. I pretty much think that he was thinking about it. But because of his confused face, uh, I mean, we started laughing and then I said, no, I'm not being serious about it though. We can work on brain control drones. And, uh, and we started brainstorming after that. So, okay, what would be the technical approaches to this? How well we can actually look into? Uh, and then we started working in, in, on a prototype uh, that uh, pretty much uh, for, that took weeks and, and months and be able to actually even improve the uh, prototype to a, a new uh, to a new phase. Then, after we had a prototype, though, we started thinking about okay, yes, we have to see how can we collect a, a lot of data. But at the same time, we want to see how we can incorporate this into society now, in the short term and long term, that can uh, help society somehow. I'm like, okay, so uh, something that we knew at the time was that people are not really educated or, or they just don't know that brain control machines is real. Even today, when I talk about my research, people think I'm talking about a movie. I pretty much start saying brain drone racing, brain control drone. They're like, wait, was that in the movie Star Wars? Uh, I don't recall that. I was like, no, that's like actually, that's what we do in, in, in my research lab. So uh, that's one of the things, that how can we educate people in, in society that brain control machines are, is real, right? Brain control wheelchairs, neuroprosthetics, and so on. But at the same time, we also noticed that drone races started becoming popular. Uh, we saw that uh, people were racing drones in a first-person view. So we decided to like, okay, so we noticed that people are racing drones. It's becoming popular. How about if we introduce a new sport called brain drone race? And uh, so the idea of brain drone race, besides the fact that it will be helping people uh, be able to see how brain control technology works, it also will help them 
uh, 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 see, uh, pretty much see a, a new version of racing drones with the brain, which pretty much they have seen the, um, the other version, which is just racing drones in general. But what is brain drone racing? So what we really, at least in a nutshell, we look at it as it is the inclusive sport that regardless of your physical abilities, your age, gender, and even ethnicity or race, you can all compete in the same race or competition. So let's put it into perspective uh, uh, real quick. Any other sports, at least in the United States, they always have divisions, right? So they have, uh, for basketball, they have for different genders. Uh, even tennis, right, they have different genders and so on. And especially if somebody has a, uh, consider, uh, uh, has a physical disability, they also have uh, the Special Olympics for that. So, for example, if somebody's missing one arm, or even missing both arms, or is in a wheelchair, they probably cannot com go and, uh, and compete against Rafael Nadal or Serena Williams in tennis. But they can bring run race. Why? Because only the brain is needed. Right, so, it, it, so it, for example, another example is the physical attributes right, of athletes. So I cannot go and compete against LeBron James <laughs> playing basketball and dunking and things like that because one, he's a, a pro, I only play for, uh, as a hobby, and he also spends about a million dollars a year on his, on his body. I probably don't even spend a hundred dollars even a year in my own body. So I'm already at a big disadvantage, right, playing basketball against him. But we can definitely compete in brain run racing. Again, why? Because it's that mental aspect. It's really your brain. Regarding, uh, regardless of your physical abilities and stage, even if somebody's in a wheelchair, they can still compete at the same level of somebody who's not in a wheelchair. Uh, regardless of gender, right? So this is actually, again, it's the inclusive sport that allows different genders to compete because, it, again, only the brain is needed. There's no need to have one competition just for men or, or, or women and so on. This is what allows us to, uh, that's what the idea of neurosports, of competing, uh, just using your brain to be able to uh, compete in a sport, allows that inclusivity. So you can think about brain drone racing as the, uh, how bringing science fiction to real life, right? So when we think about controlling drones with your brain, you're thinking about the force from Star Wars. If you're a big fan of Star Wars, you start thinking how uh, Jedi start using their hands, and pretty much it's more mental, right? You need to be relaxed and be able to be concentrated and be able to, uh, to, be able to use the force. Similar to brain racing. You need to be relaxed. You need to be, be able to concentrate for a long period of time. And so the person who concentrates for a longer time can actually uh, raise the drone even faster. And the idea of brain drone racing, just like any other race, is get going from point A to point B at the fastest time. And the way you do that it, when it comes, to, it comes to brain drone racing, it's not necessarily who is faster in terms of actually driving a car, like right with a, uh, with a wheel or a joystick. It's really more for how long can you concentrate and how much. Are you relaxed? If you're feeling stressed, or anxious uh, 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 or during the race, that definitely puts you in a disadvantage, which helps you also possibly even train your mental state. If you do some meditation already, that can actually put you in an advantage some, against somebody who doesn't do any meditation. That's the idea of, uh, of brain drone racing as well. So how does this work? How can you control a drone with your brain? At least in a nutshell, like I mentioned before, about how we take those signals and then we use algorithms to clean them up and classify them, we also, the idea of, of brain drone racing is you also need to create a profile. Why do we need to create a profile? Well, uh, each of our brain activities is unique. So if you try to use my profile to, you, to control a drone, you won't be able to because your brain activity is unique and it's different from mine. Even for related, right? So you can be, uh, you can be my sibling or even my parents, they will be able to use my, my profile and vice versa. Once you create that profile, then you, uh, we do two basic steps, at least at the minimum. The first one is the calibration phase, which is the baseline, uh, where you just close your eyes and relax. I don't think about anything at all. So it's like similar to meditation, right? So you just sit, uh, you sit there, 
relax, don't think about anything, and don't, don't concentrate about any other task. What, what, during that process, we're training the machine to be able to recognize your brain patterns when you're not thinking about anything at all. The second phase is when you're actually uh, think, imagining a movement and mapping that to a specific task. So if, uh, if you want the drone to move forward, you imagine a specific movement. For example, so if I want the drone to move forward, uh, then I start imagining my left hand opening and closing. If I want the drone to move backwards, I uh, have my right hand opening and closing. Right, so one, we're training the machine to be able to recognize my brain patterns when I'm imagining the, uh, the, uh, the movement of my left hand and also the movement of my right hand. At the same time, we were also training humans to imagine a movement. So we don't imagine to walk. We just walk, right? So I always ask, like, uh, like how many of you uh, actually go home and open and close a door with your brain? Nobody does that, right? So you just open and, uh, and close the door with your own hand. So eventually, we'll be able to do that with brain-computer interfaces. So uh, when it comes to brain drone racing, there are two parts of it. It's, of course, racing physical drones. And the other side of the thing is, is also the brain e-racing, which is, we consider the e-sports version of it. So now, the, the, we came up with the simulation is because there's a lot of um, regulations when to flying drones. Uh, we cannot just fly them everywhere. We probably cannot fly them close to schools unless there's special per permission. We cannot fly them uh, uh, close to airports. And even fly flying them inside the building could be problematic because it depending on the size of the drone. Right? You don't want to just go and break anything. Or even worse, giving a brand new haircut to somebody with using the drone propellers. That would definitely be scary. So now with the simulation, you can have a similar experience where you go through the same exact training. The difference is instead of controlling a physical drone, you're controlling a virtual drone. It, it allows you to train anywhere without worrying about any regulation. And at the same time, you can actually keep training your attention and your imag imaginary movement. So uh, I would like to uh, add that, uh, uh, say it again, is this is an inclusive sport. And the great Nelson Mandela said that a sport can create hope where once there was only despair. It is more powerful than government in breaking down racial barriers. It laughs in the face of all types of discrimination. Now, we envision that one day people will be able to actually use brain computer interfaces for all types of purposes to track their, uh, uh, pretty much their, their, their activities when they're working out, or when they're actually studying. So if I, don't, uh, I know I don't pay attention very well, I would like to track my attention and get some sort of feedback. Just like how we use wearables and Fitbit. At the same time, even today, we need more inclusivity. We do. We, we see that everywhere. And we believe that brain drone racing, neurosport, allows that inclusivity regardless of gender, age, your physical abilities or disabilities, and race. Thank you.